Good morning. Welcome. Today, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Job, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1. You know, bad days come in all sizes and shapes. And the title of our message today is What to Do When Your World Crumbles In. This world is full of pain and suffering. From the cradle to the grave, there are things that happen that bring tears to our eyes. But the point of this whole series is that life doesn't always make sense. And if we aren't careful, we can become so focused on the here and the now that it obscures our vision of heaven. This world is filled with suffering, but there is another world that we can anticipate. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You know, it's been a bad week for a lot of people, but few people have ever had the kind of bad week that Job suffered. Now, if you missed the previous uh, messages, Let me just review the story for us. Job was a righteous guy who was blessed with great wealth and a wonderful family. And at a gathering before God, Satan alleged that the only reason that Job served God was because he was so blessed. And so Satan charged that if Job lost all of it, he would curse God to his face. Now, God knew Job's heart, but in order to demonstrate to Satan that he was wrong, God gave Satan permission to test his theory, and Satan went to work, and Job suffered. But never lose sight of the conclusion of the story. Job endured all the pain, all the trials that the Satan tossed his way, and he never lost his faith. In the end, God restored to Job more than he had in the first place. Let's read together in Job chapter 1, beginning in verse number 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead." And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. You know, life has a way of tumbling in without warning. 
Job is the best model that we have on how to deal with pain and suffering. From him, we learn that there are four important action steps for when your world crumbles in. The first action step is express your grief honestly. Job expressed his grief in three ways. It says in verse 20, Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Now the tearing of the clothes was a customary way of expressing immediate grief in the ancient world. You probably have felt so much inner pain before that you wanted to just tear something. Tearing cloth is a metaphor for a broken heart. There's the stain of pulling and the release when the cloth tears. And tearing his clothes was an immediate expression of his grief. But the shaving of his head was a long-term expression of his pain. Every time that he would reach up and feel his head or he felt the chill on his scalp, he was reminded of his grief. And as his hair grew out, it was also a gradual reminder to him that life goes on. And with time, the pain lessens. When he fell down, he collapsed. But he didn't collapse into helplessness or hopelessness. Rather, he fell down to worship God. When you're hurting, it's okay to express your grief. In fact, it's important to express your grief. Grief that is submerged and suppressed can lead to unhealthy emotional problems. To express your grief, you need to understand exactly what grief is. There's an equation for grief that can be expressed this way. Change plus loss equals grief. Change plus loss equals grief. Now, change is never easy, and some life changes are minor, but there are major changes in life in which we lose something precious, and that creates grief. You know, uh, Job's life changed in one day when he experienced material and personal loss. He lost all of his wealth in a single day. Uh, I checked the current price of livestock, and according to today's prices, Job's livestock was worth over $29 million. Now remember, he had 7,000 sheep, and a good sheep sells today for $1,800 in Saudi Arabia. And it, we read that he had 3,000 camels, and they go for about $2,000 today. In fact, there's a website that allows you to see how many camels you can get for your husband. It turns out that Kathy can get rid of me and she can gain 33 camels. But think about what Job lost. It would be as if you lost your job, your bank account, your investments, and your retirement account in a single day. Worse than the loss of his $29 million was his personal loss. His three daughters, his seven sons, were gathered in a house when a killer storm blew in. The walls of the building collapsed, and they were all killed. If you notice the text, it says that the first messenger came and he explained the loss of, of some of the livestock. And as he was speaking, it says, the next messenger came and he gives some bad news. And before he could finish his bad news, a third messenger came with some more bad news. And then another messenger came after that before the third guy ever got his story all the way out. And so on the heels of hearing of the loss of all of his livestock and all of his servants and his family and his wealth, Job learned that his family was gone. His world came tumbling in. 
And Job didn't deny his grief. He didn't slap a fake smile on his face and flippantly say, everything's going to be okay. No, he cried long and hard, but he never lost his faith in God. In chapter 16, Job admitted how deeply he was grieving. He said, I have sewn uh, sackcloth over my skin and buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping. Deep shadows ring my eyes. You know, when you lose something, you grieve. And the greater the sense of loss, the greater the depth of your grief. You know, I've been told that there's nothing to compare with the depth of grief over the death of a child. But death isn't the only thing that causes grief. When you lose a job, you grieve. When you lose a mate through divorce or death, you grieve. When you lose a friend or lose a house to fire or flood or lose your freedom, you grieve. Whatever the nature of your loss is, it's important to express the grief honestly. It doesn't show a lack of faith to cry a river of tears. The Bible says that Christians sorrow, but we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Even in the midst of our pain over loss, we have a hope. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief, and he wept out of compassion to, with, with Mary and Martha for, at their brother's grave, even though he planned to resurrect Lazarus. <coughs> but Jesus was so heartbroken over the sinful people in Jerusalem that he stood over a hill overlooking the city and he wept better, bitter tears. It's okay to grieve. In fact, it's good to grieve. Now that brings us to the second action step that we see. We need to acknowledge that every blessing is a gift from God. Job acknowledged everything that he had was a gift from God. He said in verse 21, the Lord gave. You know, you came into this, this world naked. And even though you might be buried in a $500 suit, you'll enter the afterlife with zero material assets. You'll never see a U-Haul following the hearse in a funeral procession. You can't take it with you. Some people think everything good in their life has come to them because they've earned it. And there are people who think society owes them a living or that they deserve to have all their needs met. But the Bible clearly teaches that everything good in life is a gift that comes from God above. We read in James chapter 1 verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. See, while everything in the world is changing, God doesn't change. The story of Job took place almost 4,000 years ago. And the very same God who had a personal relationship with Job is the God who wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to give you the gift of life. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life has nothing to do with how long you live. It's a gift that changes the whole quality of your life. And when you've received God's gift of eternal life, it changes your entire outlook. You know, earlier this year, we were all stunned when tornadoes plowed through western Kentucky. And I saw an interview by one of the local news stations who was talking to an elderly lady who had survived those storms. She said that everything that she had, she lost. 
And when the interviewer asked if she was going to make it through this time, a beautiful smile broke out on her face, and she said, Oh, I'm going to make it through. In fact, with the Lord's help, I'm already there. You know, sadly, many people are like a hog grubbing for acorns at the foot of an oak tree. They refuse to glance up and acknowledge the source of the food. We must look up to heaven and acknowledge the source of all those good gifts. You know, as the song says, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. The third action step that we see here is to accept that God may take something away without giving you a reason. You know, verse 21 says, and the Lord has taken away. Now, in the subsequent subsequent, uh, chapters, Job is going to ask God some tough questions, and he's going to ask why? In a variety of ways, he's going to ask why, but he's never going to receive the answer that he wants to hear. Beginning in chapter 38, God starts speaking to Job, but he never gives Job a reason for why all these things happened. As far as we know, God never even let Job in on the conversation that God had with the devil. Instead, God spent four chapters reminding Job that his wisdom, his greatness, and power is far beyond our ability to comprehend. And if you think you deserve an answer to the question, why did this happen, then your concept of God is far too small. There will always be a sense of mystery and awe about God. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is writing about God's plan for the ages, and he breaks out in this observation, Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Or who is first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. You know, when you've lost something, or someone precious, it's easy to forget that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He doesn't owe us a reason. John Claypool was a pastor in Louisville, Kentucky, back in the late 60s, early 70s. He and his wife lost their daughter, Laura Lou, to leukemia. And he later explained his loss by telling a story from his childhood. Back during World War II, his family didn't own a washing machine, and since gas was rationed, they couldn't afford to drive to a laundry, and keeping their clothes clean became a challenge. And John's neighbor went into the service, and his wife moved in with her family, and they offered to let John's family use their old Bendex Ringer washer while they were gone. And they reasoned it would be better for it to be used than just sit rusting on the porch. And John helped with the family's laundry. And he said he developed a fondness for that old green Bendex. And when the war ended and his neighbors returned, and they reclaimed their washing machine. And over the course of the war, young John had actually forgotten the machine was loaned to them. So when the neighbors removed it, John was upset and angry that they would take away his washing machine. And his mother sat him down and said, John, you need to remember that the washing machine never belonged to us in the first place. That we ever got to use it at all was a gift. 
So instead of being mad at it being taken away, let's use this as an occasion to be thankful that we had it at all. And John Claypool would later say years later that as he struggled with the death of his eight-year-old daughter, he remembered that old green Bendex. And he wrote, he said, when I remember that Laura Lou was a gift, pure and simple, something that I neither earned nor deserved nor had a right to, and when I remember that the appropriate response to a gift, even when it is taken away, is gratitude, then I am better able to try and thank God that I was ever given her in the first place. That's exactly how Job felt. He knew every good thing in his life had come from God, and God had the right to take anything away. That's the kind of attitude that will keep you from becoming bitter when you face loss. The fourth action step that we see in this story is offer praise to God. When you don't feel like it, faith it. Have you ever heard the advice, cheer up, things could be worse? (laughs) Job cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. Now, next week, we're going to see how Job's pain and suffering is going to intensify as Satan attacked his health. But instead of assessing blame, Job chose to express praise to God. In verse 21, he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. What do you think Job felt like doing? There was a Mrs. Job that we're going to meet in chapter 2. In Job chapter 2 verse 9, she told Job just to curse God and die. That's what she felt like doing. And Job probably shared her feelings. But Job didn't live by feelings. He lived by faith. When you are hurting, you have to make the choice by faith to praise God. Don't fake it, faith it. It's easy to offer praise to God when everything is wonderful in your life. But when you offer God praise in the midst of your pain, it becomes a precious sacrifice. We read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, Therefore by him, speaking of Jesus, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, God taught me a lesson a few weeks ago from the strangest source. Um, You know, some time ago, I was getting ready to throw away an old can of shaving cream, and and the label on the side of the can caught my attention. It said, caution, contents under pressure. Do not incinerate or puncture. Now, if you burn or puncture a can of shaving cream, the high pressure will cause the can to explode. Um, This was an old, old can, and I even wondered if there was any pressure left in the can. But God used that label to remind me that it describes that a lot of people are going through these days. They are living under intense pressure and stress, and they may only be a few degrees away from an explosion. They can't stand the heat, and they don't know how to get out of the kitchen. If you want to know what's really inside a person, watch to see what comes out when they're under pressure. We see this every time that there's some disaster, a tornado, a blizzard, or a hurricane, or whatever. For some, that time of pressure only leads them to looting and lawlessness. That kind of behavior is disgusting, but it isn't surprising. They only confirm the scripture that says in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
But what we also see during times of disaster is an outpouring of love and concern on the part of kind uh, folks, churches and companies and individuals. They go and they open their doors and their hearts and their wallets to share with people who have been displaced by the elements of weather. And they go the second mile and the third mile to show compassion to thousands of people that they've never met before. Whatever is on the inside will come out under pressure. And there are millions of folks who are filled with the love of God. Remember, our God is the expert of bringing good out of evil. We all know that as hard as they try, we've learned our, that our government relief agencies aren't omnipotent. Now that brings me to the main point that I want to say here today. The main point is we serve a God who is all-powerful and all-loving. He specializes in bringing order out of chaos and bringing good out of bad. How many times have you heard the victims of disaster who have been interviewed and said, I've lost everything, my house, my car, my possessions, but praise the Lord, I still have my life and my family. You know, this raises the fundamental issue of the book of Job that we need to consider. If I lose everything that I hold dear, what's left to sustain me. If your sense of worth and happiness is defined by your possessions, then prepare to be devastated. But if your sense of worth and joy is based upon a living relationship with a loving God, there is nothing in this universe that can separate you from the love of God. So when you're hurting, Try following Job's example. Express your grief honestly. Don't suppress it. Acknowledge that every good and every good gift in your life has come from God. Accept the fact that God has the right to take away anything at any time. It's His world. <laughs> and in the midst of your pain, even when you don't feel like it, offer praise to God. There's one thing not to do when your world crumbles in, and that is don't blame God. Notice the last words that we read in chapter 1 of Job. It says, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Whenever we suffer, we immediately want to find someone to blame. If we can blame our suffering on our parents, our spouse, our co-workers, our society in general, we can justify our bitterness and it prevents us from moving on to becoming whole. And God gets blamed for a lot of suffering nowadays. But in spite of his pain and his unanswered question, Job never charged that God was wrong. Whenever you're going through a tough time, there's always the fear of the unknown. Job must have been afraid of what was ahead, but he put his trust fully on God. Before 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, the common belief was that if a ship from Europe sailed too far to the west, they would either fall off the edge of the world or face terrible danger. There was fear of the unknown. In England, there is an ancient nautical map dating back to the time of King Henry IV, and on it, the map makers wrote these words over the Atlantic Ocean. Here be dragons. Here be demons. Here be danger. And based on those superstitious warnings, sailors were afraid of sailing there. But there was an English navigator named John Franklin who was a mighty man of God, 
And he knew the word of God that says that God sits above the circle of the earth. And he took that same map and he crossed out those fearful words and he added these three words, there be God. If you are a servant of God, you need to know that as you sail towards your darkest fears and deepest worries, here be God. He is there to keep you and sustain you. Job discovered that. He was able to look through his tears and say, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. The late Dr. Judy Barnes was the chairman of the Department of Deaf Interpretation at Tyler Junior College in Tyler, Texas. She was also a dear Christian lady. She once wrote a song summarizing the kind of faith that sustains you when your life crumbles in. When the world comes tumbling down, there is Jesus. When there's trouble all around, he cares. Through the toil and pain and strife, he's my strength, my joy, my life. When the world comes crashing down, he's there. You know, our universe is so large, scientists can't even begin to measure it. But the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 that God measures the heavens with the span of his hand. So when your world crumbles in, the most important thing that you can do is to simply place yourself in God's hands. The safest place in the universe is in his hands. Don't ever forget those powerful words you learned as a child. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you do have the whole world in your hands. And Father, during those times of life when it seems like our world comes crashing in, Lord, we may suffer pain, we may suffer loss, but Father, you still are in control. Father, help us to place our trust in you. Lord, I pray right now that we would not look to the things of the world, our possessions and our wealth to sustain us, but Lord, that we would look to you. Father, we just pray for your help. We pray for those that might be watching this today who are going through times of grieving and suffering. Father, help them to find their peace in you. And Father, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining in today. Next week, we'll continue our series out of Job, this series that we're calling When Life Doesn't Make Sense. We hope that you can be with us. Also, we'll be live this Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m. for our online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. That's 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.